the chair represents the tree stand, and I represent the happy hunter going to my happy hunting ground. I'm going to the woods this year. I'm going to the woods this year. Going to the woods, I'm staying real clear. I'm going to the woods this year. Gonna find me a deer, being real quiet. Now you see what happened? As I went to the woods, I left a trail of particles behind me. And that's the way that, well, that's how the blue ticks find you. And that's what we have is a failure to communicate. And there's no way to avoid leaving those little particles, those molecules and things behind you. There's no spray. There's nothing that's going to stop that. Your hunting clothes, your boots, the mud hole that you stepped in is going to track with you. You're going to leave something behind. It may be something of the hay or the, the creek or whatever you went through. It may be something off the four-wheeler. But everything under the sun has some sort of a scent. That does not mean that that scent is within your threshold to smell. We already know that deer can see well in the dark well better than we can. Do you not think they can smell better than we can? If you ever had a cat or a dog who could tell that a piece of meat was going bad before you could, do you don't think that perhaps maybe deer can smell that that's not real acorn smell that you're spraying on or whatever you might be using? Animals are real good at being animals. A lot of time they're better at being wild animals than we are being hunters. The title of this video, I've called it Unscented, and maybe you picked up on that, or at least something about it anyway. It's big business every year uh, selling products to hunters with the concept that uh, they're going to make them scent free. And as the opening demonstration goes, there's no way to be scent free. There are ways that we can kind of fool ourselves in believing that we have no scent or we've reduced our scent. And I think it's probably a good idea if we haven't been eating pickled pig's feet and cooked cabbage the night before we go into the woods. I think it's probably a good idea not to be putting off an odor that is not familiar in the woods, much like if, if somebody came into your living room and moved your couch or took a big old poop in the middle of your living room and you're walking through, you're probably going to notice both of those things, both of the physical change, somebody's been messing around in there, and, and a... And a olfactory change. So deer live in the woods and if you suddenly come in there and make a big change in something that it, in a, near a trail or someplace they walk by on a regular basis there's a pretty good chance even if you smell like a pine tree and there's not been a pine tree smell there before chances are they're going to notice that or if you suddenly smell like acorns and there's no acorns around all of a sudden they're probably going to figure that out too. Uh, animals are real good at being animals, so they're going to notice a sudden change in their environment, whether it's a natural smell or not. That was kind of a, a theory that was explained to me by a gentleman. I'm going to call him Mr. Self because that's a good uh, innocuous name to, uh, to use. But anyway, we're going to have a little experiment demonstrated today. I'm going to do it. It's informal. Um, I'm going to try to and not try to run anything down one way or the other. It's just I don't really know. And I'm going to try to do this for my own satisfaction. I used to buy a, a specialty product like this when it came out because they said UV, UV uh, deer can now see into the UV. That was a study done by the University of Georgia about 10 years ago. And it was a theory. And a theory is something, of course, as you know, has not been proven. It's somebody's idea what they think might happen. And we'll maybe talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and again, that's just opinion. Uh, of course, a theory is just an educated opinion. And they may very well be right, maybe not. I don't know. 
But here's a product. First time I used this type of product, it was like, you know, best I recall, in a 32 ounce bottle. And the next time I bought it, they'd cut the they'd cut it down to 24 ounces. We left the price about the same, if not taking it up just a little bit. And then next time, I understand this year we've got yet a new, new and improved version that cost about the same, but the bottles even less. So that's going up. And here's just a simple everyday product that you buy at the grocery store and uh, it does have a uv brightener in it so let's just you know as the video goes let's just compare these and see what it actually does in a real life experiment i got some clothes let's wash them and we'll, and we'll see what they do and meanwhile um let's look a little bit at the deer and see why they're so good at what they do now we say we have ourselves a little in-home experiment. I have two relatively common type of shirt, similar camo patterns, similar ages, wouldn't you agree? Okay, I have one has a brown color, one has a camo color. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the camo collar because it's more hun hunry type stuff and I'm going to use a famous type of product here and I'm going to pour out one ounce because that's what it says for the direction use one fluid ounce and I have a shot glass, two shot glasses actually uh, that have a black line and when I measure it I'm going to fill my one ounce to that black line and I'm going to use one ounce of a commercially available product that is free and clear of perfumes and dyes and the point is we're going to wash one shirt the camo collar shirt in the UV free contains no UV brighteners and we're going to do the one with the brown collar and the one that we're going to see if it has UV brightness before we put it in there. Now the washing machine is clean, it's rinsed, so I'm going to put this in first and do the uh, specialty uh, laundry detergent without the UV brighteners in first. And then we're going to wash this one second in the non-specialty material uh, detergent and we'll see when we dry them if there's any difference whatsoever that we can determine. Now this is non-scientific, but we're going to see what we can figure out. Now, to prove which one's which, now I just want to to just to illustrate this, now we're going to do the camo collar first and prove which one has it. It certainly does not have anything in it. See? Oh my goodness. It's got a lot of UV stuff in there. Bad stuff. Must be bad stuff. It's glowing blue. Nothing in it. So I would, I would conclude that there's not a UV reactive substance in the one to the right. There must be something in that. We're getting a lot of reflectivity off of that. Let's go ahead and wash the shirt separately. I'm going to set this to the side. I'm going to move that bottle away. I'm going to take this and move this on the dryer. Take my brown collar shirt away. And we're going to start this load. So how is it that a deer can smell us and distinguish us amongst the trees and, and the rotting wood and all the other things in, in the woods all at the same time. And I think the answer lies within the length of their nose, the length of the snout, and the fact that they have a layer and it rolls right back around and they have fold upon fold. So it's not just one, one length, it's actually wrapped upon itself sort of like a honeycomb. Can you, is the camera getting the depth in here? Now, in the structure of the nose, it actually br brings out about here and comes down, forms the edge of the upper lip. 
there's a piece, there's a piece of cartilage that comes through here and rides in this little gap that, that separates the left and the right sides of, of their, their sinuses, their nostrils. But they're able to bring that air in and land so many more particles on so many more receptors that they have what I've had people say in, in literature a thousand times more sensitive smelling than we do. So the concept just because we smell something, well, I smell nothing, man, I can't smell nothing, it's scentless. That may not be true. That just because we can't smell it doesn't mean the animals can't smell it. And just like, like, like I used earlier, if you've ever had a dog or a cat who could smell something in, in the tuna fish going bad, deer may very well be able to determine that that's not a, a, a valid um, acorn smell for in his woods. And so you may actually be running them off by smelling like something they know doesn't belong there. Okay, we're going to add the brown collared shirt in. And we're going to add the, oh, let's hit it, the just common perfume free, dye free detergent. And we're going to wash it in an equal volumetric amount, which is just a little more than the number one load. Uh, and I'm just doing that for a small load. My machine has small, medium, large, and super plus. The uh, detergent cup has one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to equate that pretty well much to those four loads. Let's wash them. Brown and see what happens. And this deer mount is a perfect example of eyes set wrong, completely wrong. This little fissure, or what do you want to call this crack, the lacrimal crease or the tear duct. Uh, if you've ever heard anyone say, Why are you so lacrimose? Why are you so teary eyed? Why are you so crying? Well, this is a little tear duct. Uh, people use it when setting the eye because this in this mount they've actually got the pupil set like this and that's wrong that is way wrong the deer have a horizontal pupil it's actually a rectangular pupil the, the eyeball itself is, is almost hemispherical and the actual direction of it of an eye is like uh, the pupil is actually like this. It's actually cocked up because it actually allows for a peripheral vision sound around the back of his head about like that around the front. And between the two eyes then they see almost all the way around. They're not quite as good as an owl but they can see almost around. Now a study done I think it was the University of Georgia about 10 years ago hypothesized that deer could see into the UV spectrum. Now that was based upon, um, if I recall, the fact that they, they didn't think that, that uh, is it the tapetum lucidium that allows the light to go pass through, comes back in, gives it that reflective look, that gives it that light amplification, that it allowed the UV into the eye and deer eye, goat eyes, things in that same family have that same horizontal pupil, which gives them a very good peripheral depth perception on a plane. They're not as good looking up. They can look up if they move their head up, but they're normally concentrated on a plane around them because that's where their predators normally, historically, come after them. The other feature is when they necropsy their eye they found that they have a real high population of rods versus a very low population of cones. Now cones are the color the color sensitive structures and they didn't have really many if any for red which is why they believe they can't see orange. They can't distinguish orange. They can see the color orange but they're like red green colorblind. 
so they can see greens and blues, but they can't really see the, the reds. They don't can distinguish them, they're not blind to them, they just can't really tell them from the other shades. And the high presence of the rods are black and white shades, they're low light level shades. In the human eye, in the center of the eye, we have the macula. And that's where we have the highest density of the cones, where we have the, the, uh, the color determination. The detail vision is in the center of our eye. And anybody who has macular degeneration loses that detail. But we get the peripheral vision, the side vision, is where we, get, where we pick up motion. If you think about it, if something's going to whack you in the head or come at you, you see it a lot of times through the side vision, but you don't get a lot of detail. And that's what deer eyes have in them. They have that similar structure. So they see motion, but they don't necessarily see a lot of detail. And that was the theory. Now the concept that they can see ultraviolet is just a theory. It's not been proven to my knowledge. And uh, as we're washing clothes, and we're going, we're going to do this experiment, we're going to find out with some fairly powerful UV sources of two different frequencies whether or not the detergents with or without a UV uh, brightener has a hoot and a holler worth of difference in, in this unofficial type of experiment. So let's get on with some other analysis on let's see what the actual cost of doing a load of laundry is going to be with these two detergents. I was in a famous sporting store and they have some specialty products here. And looking at the price they have is $9 a bottle, that's without tax. And looking on the label itself, it says that it will do up to nine loads. And the math is simple there. Nine loads for nine dollars is a dollar a load. Now looking back at just grocery store conventional laundry detergent without any dyes or fragrances, $12.79 a jug for that for 96 loads works out to 13 cents a load. And of course your water and your electricity in either case. The big question is, how does it perform? All right, as you can see, I've hung the shirts up on a curtain rod up there and they're about the same angle. They're about the same size because they're both my shirts. And if you recall, one of them has the brown collar and one of them has, but you know, that's not going to make any difference because, you know, one was washed in a, a detergent that has, you know, no uh, perfumes, no dyes, but it has the, the UV uh, reflective stuff in there. And so this is going to be real obvious, I'm sure, which one's which when I put the UV light on it. Now, remember, most... UVs that are not germicidal have two frequencies. You can get 365, which is a shorter wavelength than a 395. So I'm going to turn off this light, simulate some dark time. Is it dark time? All right, and I'm going to hit it with uh, the lower, the, the longer, or I'm sorry, the shorter wavelength. And I don't see any difference, do you? I don't see any difference. Let me kick it the other light on. That's, that's both of them together. I, I still don't see any, any any real difference. I mean, nothing that I can see jumps out at me. Now, I'm going to get the longer wavelength, which is closer to a traditional black light. I don't, I don't really see... Well, this is confusing to me. Well, that one's got the brown collar, so that one is the one that was washed in in just the traditional buy it at the grocery store stuff. And that's the one that was washed in the special stuff. I can't tell a bit of difference. And this is a, you know, th up to three watt electrical input UV special inspection light. I can't tell the difference. Let me, well, let me get that short wavelength there, that 365. I don't understand. I thought this was a big deal. Hmm. Well, we're going to go back and talk about this. And while I was at the grocery store getting the uh, detergent, I picked up a 
stick of this is a three ounces for two dollars of just uh, unscented antiperspirant. Uh, nothing extra in this. I guess this would be for if you had uh, allergies or something like that. But uh, it's also got no fragrance to it. Or I did snap a picture while I was there looking at shelves of a famous big box type of sports store. It says right here on the label. Regularly priced, $6.99. They got it on special for deer hunters. <laughs>